It is now time for question period. The member from Nepean Carleton. Thanks uh, very much, Speaker. I appreciate the opportunity today. Uh, my question is for the Premier. For weeks, I have been requesting that you tell the ratepayers how much they are paying on their electricity bills because of the cancelled gas plants, and you keep refusing. I've been asking here in this chamber for two weeks. Yet today, Dwight Duncan, the former Deputy Premier, the former Minister of Energy, the former Finance Minister, told the Justice Committee these types of analysis would be done. In fact, he said, and I quote, the quote, government would routinely look at the impact aspect, close quote. For someone who has such a passion for open government, you sure fail in spelling and actually practicing it, Premier. One of the most powerful colleagues that you have ever served with told this assembly through Question. the Justice Committee you would have had that information at your disposal. Why won't you adhere to open government and finally release how much individual ratepayers are going to be on the hook for your cancelled gap? Please, please stop the you see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, uh, I haven't seen the, uh, the transcript from the committee this morning, and I know the government house leader or the Minister of Energy will want to uh, speak to the specifics, Mr. Speaker. But I will just say that, uh, you know, I have said all along that uh, Cabinet made decisions, Mr. Speaker. Government had, uh, had information, and that information has been, avail has been made available to the committee. Tens of thousands of documents have been handed over to the committee, Mr. Speaker. Uh, questions have been answered. We broadened the scope of the uh, committee, and I appeared before the committee, Mr. Speaker. And uh, that information has been made available. And uh, I, uh, I look forward to the uh, supplementary. Thank you, supplementary. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Speaker, and thank you, for Premier, for again showing that you care not about open governments, that you only care about photo ops. But I wish you knew how to spell government. It's very important to the people. And you have known the true cost, or at least the true range of the cancelled Oakville plant since 2011. Don't take my word for it. Order. Take yeah. Serge Imbronios, the Deputy Minister of Energy, who said in December of 2011, you knew that the cost would exceed $700 million. All the while, you and your colleagues said it was only $33 to $40 million. You want to know why, Speaker? They wanted to rely on the province of Ontario and the people within it, the ratepayers who pay the bills. They wanted to, to, to rely on a distinction between taxpayer and ratepayer. It's absolutely despicable that she did this, and I have other words to like you it would be unparliamentary. You now know it costs $1.1 billion. You know how much it costs on the ratepayers. Will you table that today Thank or you. will you get the auditor general? Thank you. Be seated, please. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you, Premier. Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I, I really believe that it is important that we have gone through this process. When I came into this office, I said that uh, it was important to me that we open up the process, that we make sure that the information was available. The reason that the Justice Committee, Mr. Speaker, has had the opportunity to hear from the, uh, the witnesses and has uh, received the documentation, Mr. Speaker, is that we changed the process on this side of the House and we opened up the process. We asked, I asked the Auditor General to look at the Oakville situation, Mr. Speaker. So the information that has been made available has been made available because of our commitment to that openness mr speaker and i said that you know the questions that were being asked by the opposition would be answered they have been answered they have the information mr speaker that's as it should Answer. be and what is really important now is that we have a better process in place so that this will not happen again and it would be great Thank to have you. a report from the committee mr speaker Thank you. final supplementary Thank you very much speaker again back to the premier there are pretzels that are less twisted than your account of this story over the power plants. Going back to uh, the uh, open government, you told this assembly on multiple occasions that as a cabinet minister, you never discussed the cancelled Mississauga plant in a cabinet meeting. But Dwight Duncan, your colleague who sat in the chair right beside your current finance minister, told our committee today that yes, it was actually discussed. He said, that the Mississauga plant was discussed in cabinet. Discussed in cabinet. For a premier who likes to talk about conversations with the public, you sure do have lots of things you like to keep from them too. Telling this how 
That's one thing. When it is not true, is contemptible, Speaker. Again, the pre I'm going to ask the member to withdraw and uh, be careful of how she's wording. Thanks, withdrawn Speaker. Again, which is it? We know you sat in a cabinet and we know you signed the Question. cabinet document. You did so knowingly. You did so knowing that there was going to be a significant cost to this. You signed your name on the dotted line. Why did you, you do it? And why? Thank you. Thank you. The uh, minister, the minister of the environment, will come to order. The the other members that are making the comment will allow me to do my job. The member from the P and Carlton would withdraw. Indicate to her that if it continues, it's more than just simply once. It's too many times, and I will uh, bypass her and ask her to withdraw. That's it. Premier. Energy. Mr. Speaker, uh, yes, uh, former Finance Minister uh, Dwight Duncan uh, was at committee. Uh, let's hear of some of the other things that he said, Mr. Speaker. That those decisions were made by the former Finance Minister, the former Premier, and the former Minister of Energy. Full stop. He also said, Mr. Premier, decision on Cabinet document was made by former Premier and former Finance Minister. Mr. Speaker, with respect to the rates, the member would know when she received her briefing on how to be the energy critic that rates are set by the Ontario Energy Board in a very public and open way, Mr. Speaker. I want to know whether or not she's investigated how the rates are set at the OEB. In addition, Mr. Speaker, there's a long-term energy plan which projects rate increases over a 20-year period. Mr. Speaker, the existing plan projects increases at 3.5 percent over a 20-year period, which is less than the previous government's 20-year period. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. New, new question? The member from Newmarket Aurora. Thank you. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Yesterday, I asked the Premier about the $770 million Bombardier contract that was signed under her watch as Transportation Minister. She refused to answer any questions regarding that contract. The contract committed the province, through Metrolinx, to purchase 182 LRT vehicles for four projects in the City of Toronto. That contract speaker also set out very specific delivery dates and substantial penalties if those dates were not honoured. My question for the Premier today is this. Before she signed off on that contract, Minister of the Environment, come to order. Did last she time. inform herself of the details of that contract? Was she aware that it contained specific delivery dates and penalty Question. clauses? And did she know that she was putting millions of tax dollars at risk by signing off on that contract? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know the Minister of Transportation has some specifics on this uh, this issue, and he will uh, answer the supplementary. But I uh, I want to just say, Mr. Speaker, that I am absolutely proud of the fact that we have got we have got vehicles being built by Bombardier in Thunder Bay, Mr. Speaker, to supply the transit bill yeah, that is happening across the GTHA, Mr. Speaker. I am very proud of the billions of dollars that we are investing in transit, Mr. Speaker. To and you know, part of the reason that we are doing that is that we have to catch up on transit building in this province because there were years of neglect, Mr. Speaker, where there was no investment in transit, where congestion was allowed to increase, Mr. Speaker, and we know the economic toll that that has taken and takes every year. So I'm proud of our record in terms of uh, investing in transit. We will continue to do that, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate that all of a sudden the uh, party opposite is interested in Thank transit, you. Mr. Speaker, but it's a little bit Thank late. So the premier, the premier is proud that LRT vehicles are being built in Thunder Bay that have nowhere to go. <laughs> this is not a good example. The, the premier's response of transparency and open government. The current minister of transport proved yesterday that he knows nothing about this file. It was the premier who signed off on the contract. The cost of that contract, because it was a sole source contract speaker, was inflated by more than $200 million. 
And now, because Metrolinx is stuck with those cars, here's what they're doing. They're forcing municipalities like the region of Waterloo to buy those cars, forcing them to bypass an open tendering process so they can offload those vehicles onto the citizens question. of Waterloo region and others. And so I'm asking the Premier this question. Will she table that contract so that we can see the full cost of Thank penalties you. to the people? Thank you. Towards the end of the question, I was having difficulty hearing the member from Newmarket Aurora because someone on your own side was yelling too much. Premier. Your transportation and infrastructure. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I don't know what the member opposite is talking about. Um, the, uh, order. Order. Order, please. Now I will point out individuals. Thank you. The member from Leeds Grenville will come to order. That's one. Carry on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, 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 you know, I, if you don't want to use a BlackBerry or email, good old-fashioned telephone to Metrolinx works really well, Mr. Speaker. Oh, uh, there, there is. No, I don't know what the fantasy is he's constructing, but there is. The only payment that's been put out recently, Mr. Speaker, was a $65 million progress payment to Bombardier, Mr. Speaker. Metrolinx very astutely and very wisely has bundled all of our LRT purchases, whether it's for the Kitchener-Waterloo line or for the Anchorage line, and very wisely uses the buying power of all these municipalities together to do progressive purchases of equipment. There is nothing wrong. As a matter of fact, we're getting significant Thank savings, you. and these contracts are working really Thank you. well. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, the minister confirmed that he knows nothing about this fund. The reality is that a contract has been signed. There are penalty clauses for failing to take delivery on the specified date of delivery. He can try to waffle on this as much as he wants. The Premier wants transparency. Why don't we start with this fund? First, the Premier signed off on a sole source contract that inflated the cost of those vehicles by more than $200 million. Second, because there were no competitive bids, they're now stuck with it, and the projects that they were intended for have not appeared. And that's why they're stuck. And so now, one of those consequences is they're trying to offload those vehicles onto municipalities like the region of Waterloo. They told the region of Waterloo they could Question. not go to, to open tendering because they were forcing them to take these cars. I want to ask the Premier this. Will she stop downloading her mistakes onto municipalities Thank you. across the Thank you. Minister. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, what, what I said very carefully is I don't know what the member is talking about because I can't find any evidence to support. Stop. I know you've done it, but I'm going to ask it. Will the member withdraw, please? Again. And uh, the member from Renfrew uh, will come to order. <laughs> Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So the way this works, and, and quite frankly, I, I have a good relationship with Ken Sealing and uh, Rob Pritchard and Bruce McQuaig, who I speak to on a regular basis. No one has raised any concern about this, so I don't know who's raising concerns with the member office, Mr. Speaker. We we use the purchasing power of large municipalities, which means that Toronto area and Mississauga have a lot of capacity to buy a lot of vehicles. So we buy them, and we buy them when we share them. So we have agreements with Kitchener-Waterloo. There are hundreds of vehicles being bought. As I said many times, we're also buying subway technology. The member from Barrie would know his answer is a major recipient of, of those contracts because the, because the tunnels are there. And yes, they get shifted, Mr. Speaker, and with 15 programs. Projects. Thank you. The timing changes. Thank you. New question. The, the leader of the third party. 
Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Ontarians paying the highest electricity bills in Canada have some serious questions about how their Liberal government makes decisions that hit their hydro bills. Can the Premier confirm today news reports that she attended a $10,000 plate fundraiser organized by private nuclear operator Bruce Power just days before Order. the government made key decisions about Ontario's energy future? Wow. Mr. Speaker, if the leader of the third party is asking whether I, like as she and the leader of the uh, Conservatives do, if I fundraise, yes, Mr. Speaker, I attend fundraising events. I attend fundraising events with many, many people, uh, and there is access across the, the political uh, spectrum, Mr. Speaker, and it's part of the it's part of the democratic process. And one of the things that I always say at fundraisers is I thank people for taking part in that part of the democratic process, Mr. Speaker. And uh, the, the fundraiser to which the leader of the third party uh, refers, Mr. Speaker, was completely unrelated to a decision around new nuclear, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Speaker, can the uh, Premier tell us who attended and whether she discussed with any of the attendees the government's pending decision on the Stop the Stop the The members on this side will come to order. Do you need to repeat? Yeah, thanks, Speaker. Can the Premier tell us who attended and whether she discussed with any of the attendees the government's pending decisions on nuclear power? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The leader of the third party knows full well that all of the, the information about the, the amounts and the people who have uh, donated are, are those those uh, pieces of information are posted once the checks have been uh, have been processed, Mr. Speaker. We brought in that process, Mr. Speaker. We made it uh, mandatory for those uh, for that information to be made available. So, Mr. Speaker, as the leader of the third party does, and as the leader of the opposition does, Mr. Speaker, Speaker, we all take part in fundraising events. It's part of the process, Mr. Speaker. It takes money to uh, to make uh, political parties able to. To function, Mr. Speaker, and that that applies to all parties. And the conversations that happen at those fundraisers, Mr. Speaker, are wide-ranging. I think the uh, Minister of Energy described it as brainstorming. That happens at uh, events across the province, Mr. Speaker, with a, a wide range of uh, organizations and Thank individuals. You. Supplementary. Speaker, for nearly a decade, the government ignored the evidence that new nuclear plants would be expensive and unnecessary. In fact, the government plowed ahead and spent $180 million on plans that were doomed. Speaker. For years, they could not be persuaded to see common sense. Speaker. But now, people see that private interests with a lot riding on this decision were able to get access to the Premier, and lo and behold, the Liberals changed a policy that they had held for years. Will the Premier admit, Speaker, that at the very least, this doesn't look very good? Well, Mr. Speaker, Bruce Power has donated to the NDP and to the PCs this year, Mr. Speaker. So the fact is that organizations donate to all the parties, Mr. Speaker. They're in conversation with all of us, Mr. Speaker, because it is part of the political process. But the fact is that planning in the energy sector is extremely important. And the uh, the leader of the third party, I don't know if she if she has looked at the energy plans that we have put in place, Mr. Speaker. I don't know how closely she has looked at the changes in supply, Mr. Speaker. I don't know if she I don't know if she recognizes that it's very important to understand what the projections are as you make plans going forward. The work that has been done in order yes, to prepare for possible new build is work that will not go to waste, Mr. Speaker. It's information that is needed that may be used in the future, and we are being responsible in responding to current situation, Mr. Speaker. New question. Thank you, Speaker. Part. My next question is to the Premier. Ontario households and businesses are paying the highest electricity bills in the country, and they're tired of paying for decisions that have more to do with the Liberal Party's interests than the public interest. $1.1 billion for cancelled private power plants in Oakville and Mississauga. 
$180 million on doomed nuclear plans, $950 million of uh, nuclear refurb planning uh, on contracts that they've signed without knowing what the final price tag is going to be for those plans, Speaker, and decisions being made behind closed doors. Does the Premier think this is a good way to run an electricity system in the province of Ontario? So, Mr. Speaker, I'm just going to go over. I'm just going to go over some of the uh, some of the things that we have done to stabilize the energy system in the province. Because if you remember, Mr. Speaker, when we came into office, there was a, a fair degree of disarray in terms of energy in this province. So, we've invested in modernizing and rebuilding approximately 12,000 megawatts of new, cleaner power for Ontario. We don't any longer have an energy deficit. We don't need to worry about the constant threat of brownouts, Mr. Speaker. We've invested over $10 billion in improvements in Hydro One systems, including upgrades to over 7,500 kilometres of power lines. The member from, well, never mind. Just relax. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Speaker, that transmission network is so important to the health of the energy system. So that investment in uh, 7,500 kilometres of power lines is critical to the stability of the system. Our green energy strategy has attracted $24 billion in private sector investment, Mr. Speaker, and it's created Answer. over 31,000 jobs. Ontario has 2,700 clean tech firms, employs 65,000 people in the clean tech sector, Mr. Speaker. We have taken action on energy. We have a much more stable system than when we came into office, Mr. Speaker. That's what planning does for you, Mr. Answer. Speaker, and we will continue to act in that responsible manner. Supplementary. Well, you know what, Speaker? People accept that mistakes happen, but when what they don't accept is making the same mistake over and over and over again. The Premier says wasting $1.1 billion was a mistake. But she's signing contracts that are putting Ontarians on the hook for almost a billion dollars, and she has no idea where the money stops, Speaker. The Premier says she'll be open and transparent, but people see decisions being made behind closed doors that drive electricity prices through the roof. Why hasn't the Premier learned that people should come first? Thank you, Premier. Minister of Energy. Energy. Mr. Speaker, expenditures to date on nuclear refurbishment are for definition phase activities such as the establishment of the project organization, scope finalization, engineering, planning, procurement, and contracting. The idea that this is secret and nobody knows about it is a pile of bunk, Mr. Speaker. All of OPG's expenditures. Excuse me. Minister. Minister. The member from Eglinton Lawrence and the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek take it outside. Mr. Speaker, all, all of OPG's expenditures related to nuclear refurbishment are reviewed by the independent Ontario Energy Board as part of the rate setting process. Exactly. It's all public information. OPG is taking significant steps to ensure refurbishment at Darlington is done right including a staged approach to refurbishment. We have selected an independent oversight advisor for the Darlington refurbishment project through an open, competitive yes, RFP process. This advisor will provide regular updates on the progress of Darlington nuclear refurbishment Excellent. to the Ministry Thank of you. Energy. This will include, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. Thank you. Be seated, please. Final supplementary. Well, we know the Premier has wasted $1.1 billion on gas plant relocations. We've been told that $180 million was wasted on plans for nuclear plants, but no one knows what the real cost is because the Premier is refusing to call in the auditor. And the Premier has signed contracts worth almost a billion dollars without any idea how high the final price tag will be in the future. Speaker, that's the past, that's the present, and that's the future. How can the Premier say that she has learned anything at all? Mr. Speaker, you know, I just wonder whether or not the leader of the third part is just being a little bit glib about this issue. Mr. Speaker, yesterday she, she referred to nuclear refurbishment as when you go out to buy a new car. 
Yeah. We're talking about a $15 billion project. And Mr. Speaker, you need a lot of due diligence. And that due diligence is being done. First of all, all of the contracts to date have been subject to Ontario Energy Board. If the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek didn't get the message the first time, you'll get it now. And if you can tell, I'm not in a happy place at this moment. So if anyone wants the test, you'll lose. Mr. Speaker, all of these costs have been subject to review by the public, independent Ontario Energy Board. In addition, Mr. Speaker, as I said, we have an independent oversight advisor who is providing regular reports on this. We have to do environmental assessment. We have to do project consideration. We have to do procurement consideration. Mr. Answer. Speaker, on a $15 billion project, I defy the third leader of the third party to suggest how you can go Thank into you. the code without the necessary. Thank you. Thank you. question? The member from Barrie. Thank you, Speaker. I didn't know they had subways Speaker, my question is to the minister responsible for the Pan Am Games. We know for a fact, Minister, that a fraction of the $235 million for the essential services budget is not the complete security budget. We've heard security figures actually too plentiful to, to list here today. Then one of your security staff has subsequently confirmed that the mystery budget has been well overblown. So, Minister, today, I want to know exactly what the budget is for all Pan Am-related security costs and if they're included in the $1.4 billion Pan Am budget. Minister, be open, be transparent with the Ontario public. Just the numbers, not your roundabout spin, not your generic talking points. Give me the goods. Thank you. The Minister responsible for the Pan Care of Pan Games. Thank you very much for the, thank you much for the, uh, the question. Uh, speaker, you know, uh, recently we heard a lot of numbers from the opposition members. We talk about the Athlete Village, you know, uh, 700 million uh, not allocated in the 1.4 billion, the TO 2015 budget. And he turned around, he seems to be surprised that uh, it's not in there. And then a few days later, he will turn around and uh, talk to the public that, you know what, I know that allocation, uh, that uh, 700 million uh, was not in the uh, 2015 budget for over two years. And then uh, give you another example here, Speaker. He talk about the, uh, the security. He keeps saying the, uh, the, uh, the Pan Am game security will be Answer. about a billion dollars. And then he will turn around, you know what? That one billion dollar uh, may not be a billion dollars. So, Speaker, what we've been- Thank you. Thank you. The member from Durham will come to order. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. All right, uh, another game of Ring Around the Rosie here. I'm not sure if you don't know, Minister, or you just don't want me to know. I'm trying to figure that part out. Perhaps the Minister is too busy cooking the books on the Pan Am Games to actually manage his portfolio. The member will withdraw. Ron. The current, the current security budget is shrouded in ministry and, uh, mystery, and the transportation plan is a security risk. Adding 350 buses, 1,000 cars to the most congested routes in Toronto and indeed Canada to transport 7,000 plus athletes is ridiculous, Minister, at best. And yet we don't have a plan and we don't have a budget for transportation either. Not one you're willing to share with us anyway, Minister. Your portfolio is characterized by runaway spending and poor planning. Minister, what is the exact number for the Pan Am security and the total transportation costs? Question. And are these on your Pan Am books, yes or no? Simple question, give me the goods. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you again for the, the question. Again, the, the member talked about our numbers. During General Condor. And those numbers he talked about, they were wrong. And uh, Speaker, the Pan Am game is, uh, is a big game. It's a complex game. Uh, we're going to welcome 41 countries to, uh, to Ontario. We're going to attract 250,000 tourists uh, to Toronto uh, and, and, and Ontario. Speaker, you know, it would generate $3.7 billion to our economy. Speaker, come 2015, Ontario will welcome the competitors, the coaches, 
and of yes, people, which totaling about 10,000 people. Speaker, it's a complex game. The ministry is working very hard you. to come up with those numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, the member from Wallen. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Whether it's Alfred Epps, the former president of the Liberal Party, lobbying under the table, or the Premier refusing to say whether well-connected lobbyists from Ellis Don lobbied her, or the Premier participating in a $100,000 fundraiser held by Bruce Nuclear Days before the government. Stop the clock. Order. Order. Start the clock. No. I'm still standing, but there's talking going on. Carry on. Or the Premier participating in a $100,000 fundraiser oh, held by Bruce Nuclear days before the government made a major decision impacting the nuclear industry. People are concerned about well-connected Liberal lobbyists getting special treatment. My private member's bill today will open up lobbying to greater transparency. Does the Premier agree? That it's time to open up lobby Question. and create more transparency. Thank you, Premier. Minister of Government Services. Minister of Government Services. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm, I'm very aware of the uh, the honourable members' uh, private members' bill, and I look forward to the debate this afternoon. I'm also aware that the Integrity Commissioner, who is also responsible for lobbyists, an officer of this uh, legislature has herself talked about uh, some changes to the Lobbyist Registration Act. As members are aware, uh, there were changes that were brought forward that uh, did not proceed because of prorogation, and right now we're studying that report and studying uh, uh, potential changes to strengthen it. We do have a good system here in the province of Ontario, but certainly we're open to discussions of how it could be strengthened, and as I say, I look forward to the debate this afternoon. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. My private member's bill will bring greater transparency to law lobbying in Ontario. While other parties talk about openness, only New Democrats are taking steps to make government more transparent. My bill will close loopholes so all lobbyists are registered. My bill will mean that lobbying activities are made public so Ontarians know who is lobbying who. And it will make sure there are real punishments for people who break the, the rules. The Premier says she believes it's time for more openness. New Democrats are ready to deliver results. Will the Premier follow the NDP's lead? Minister? You know, Mr. Speaker, I, I kind of think we've reached our limit here. Uh, I think on all sides of the House we recognize uh, uh, the role that lobbyists play and the fact that we need oversight, but Mr. Speaker, the holier-than-thou attitude over there is a little bit rich because let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, about a wonderful event that happened on October 16th at the Royal Conservatory of Music. It was called the Leaders' Gala. Yes, I will be attending the Leaders' Gala. We will celebrate the Ontario New Democrats at the Leaders' Gala by purchasing the following sponsorship package. My friends, for only $9,500, you will be a member of the Leaders' Circle. But hey, if that's a little too rich, for $7,500, you can join the Queen's Park Circle. Or for those of you, those of you a little down in your luck, $4,500, you could be at the council level. You could pay by check, Visa, and MasterCard, all payable to the Ontario and I'm still not in a happy place. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, 
I'm not getting attention so that I can quiet things down for others to interject. And I suspect the uh, I, th I suspect you're getting the message that I'm not happy at this moment. New question. The member from Oakville. Thank you, Speaker. My question this morning is to the Minister of Education. Minister, this week you introduced legislation that provides a clear role for government in labour negotiations in the education sector while continuing to respect the collective bargaining process. I know our government's worked hard to re rebuild the relationship with our partners in education, and I'm pleased we're working towards a much better future together, and that's going to continue to improve student success. We all know that one way to avoid labour disruption is to ensure a process exists that encourages collaborative and ongoing discussions that resolve common concerns. Minister, would you share with this House this morning the process you took in developing this framework, how you engaged our partners in the education sector in the development of this important legislation? Thank you. Mr. Education. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Oakville for this important question. Speaker, when I was first appointed Minister of Education, my first priority was to rebuild relationships with our partners so we could move forward with a common purpose and improve student achievement. The legislation that I introduced earlier this week will help the education sector move forward with a clear process and common understanding of collective bargaining in the education sector. Speaker, it's important to understand that this is made in Ontario legislation. It's a unique Ontario approach to collective bargaining that was developed through extensive consultations with our education partners, both school boards and unions Answer. and federations. We listened to their feedback. We used their input to draft a bill that reflects their res and respects their interests. Thank you. I look forward to Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for that response. I know it's important, and we all, I think, agree that it's important to persons and students in all our communities, and especially in my riding of Oakville, to know we can maintain that positive start we've had to the, uh, in our schools this school year. I understand and we'll all know that the, the current collective agreements that are in place are due to expire at the end of August 2014. That would mean that negotiations for the next round of collective bargaining will begin in very early 2014. That's only a few months away, Speaker. So, Speaker, again, through you to the Minister, can the Minister explain to this House why it's so critical for parents and students right across this province that this legislation is passed and passed as quickly as possible? Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Yes, thank you, Speaker. And the member raises an excellent question. It's absolutely essential to have the provisions of the School Board's Collective Bargaining Act in place before the next round of negotiations. As the member pointed out, almost every contract in the school board sector expires on August 2014, and we need this legislation passed so that we can move to go forward with a clear process that defines the role of the school board associations, the role of the unions and federations, and the role of the government at the central table, and the uh, role of unions and local school boards at the local tables. We need this legislation, and I hope that we can count on the members of all parties, every member in this House, to make sure that we get this legislation Answer. passed so that we can move forward with good labour relations, with a good process in the next round of collective bargaining. Thank you. Your question, the member from Holland and Norfolk. Speaker, uh, question to the Premier. People have the uh, perception government jobs pay a whole lot better than regular jobs. We know they're right. It's in the research. You know, if you add up wages, holidays, sick days, early retirement, job security, pensions, public servants come in 30 percent better off than their private sector counterparts. Counterparts who are paying the freight. These are the people who are paid. 30 percent less the, uh, with no pension. How much the president it's something? not fair, Premier, and you have allowed it to become so out of whack from what should be pay equity. Premier, 
Will you support my comprehensive pay fairness bill this afternoon? Probably. Will you support transparency to shine the light on Question. The fairness to restore pay equity between the public and private sector employees? Minister of Government Services. Yeah. Mr. Hey, Governor, hey, yeah, hey, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I read with interest uh, uh, the member's private member's bill, and as far as I can tell, what he's interested in doing is establishing more bureaucracy yeah. at wow. Queen's Park in order to, uh, to oversee a, uh, a negotiation process. The member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound is warned. <laughs> Who's next? Carry on. Mr. Speaker, a, uh, a labour relations environment which over the last uh, number of years has seen a number of agreements between the government and uh, the unions that are represented here at, uh, at Queen's Park that in fact have seen restraint across the board. The member from Renfrew and Nepissing Pembroke is warned. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, the government has concluded, uh, I'll, I'll give uh, examples, two collective agreements with its two largest unions. OPSU and AMAPSIO, as well as the Professional Engineers, Government of Ontario and Association of Physicians and Dentists and Public Service. All four contracts that were negotiated, the most recent ones, include two-year wage freezes that will help the government fight the deficit. Mr. Sir. Speaker, on this side of the House, we're taking action, not asking for more bureaucracy. Supplementary. Well, back to the Premier. It sounds like a bit, of, a bit of a start, but the research is in. C.D. Howe, Frontier Centre for Public Policy, the Fraser Institute, Canadian Federation of Independent Business, the Federal Treasury Board, government jobs. The Minister of Energy is warned. Carry on. Government jobs pay more. Higher perks, higher pay, higher pensions. It's not fair, and it's expensive. Drummond says half the Ontario budget goes to public sector compensation. Half of $128 billion is $64 billion, and they are being compensated at 30 per cent above market rates. 30 per cent too much. That equals $19 billion a year. You're paying public servants $19 billion over regular market labour rates. Premier, again, will you support transparency? Will you support Public-private pay equity, described in my bill. Will you Thank you. Thank you. Member, sit down. And I don't need the member from Trent, uh, Jim, Timmins James Bay to tell me how to keep town. Thank you. Answer. Mr. Speaker, I, I know that uh, the members opposite uh, don't like to read the budget and didn't read the budget, but I will ask him uh, to, read, uh, to break that and read page 126. Agreements have been reached with bargaining agents. The member from Holland and Norfolk is warned. Carry on. Agreements have been reached with bargaining agents representing nearly 50,000 or over three quarters. The member from Halton is warned. Carry on. Or over three quarters of the Ontario Public Service employees. The agreement reached with the MAPCO and the Professional Crown Employees of Ontario includes a two-year wage freeze and the restructuring of merit pay, short-term sickness benefits and time off provisions, which will result in cost avoidance of $24.6 million in 12-13 and $30.4 million in 13-14. The agreement reached with the Ontario Public Service Employees Union OPSU includes a two-year wage freeze Answer. and a reduction in the entry level. It goes on and on. This agreement will avoid costs of $34.1 one million in 2013 and 37.4 million in 2014. We're taking action. We don't need more bureaucracy. Thank you. New question. The member from Algoma, Manitoulin. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning is to the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. The Ontario government claims to be open for business and to mining companies and the economic benefits they will bring to this province. But the reality is that this government has been sitting on the sidelines for years and failed to establish even the simplest of mining development plans that involve communities, First Nations, and companies alike. Companies are told to drive the process of consultation without any government input or guideline, a process which is creating animosity with First Nations and it is delaying development and jobs. Will this government take action before companies and investment dollars start fleeing our province? 
Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And quite frankly, I sure. think the member could not be more wrong. Um, we are seeing, uh, obviously, some great opportunities moving forward with the mining sector. Uh, I was just up in Lac des Ailes a couple of days ago uh, um, I, when they commissioned a new mine site. Great consultation with the First Nation there, Gull Bay First Nation. And we're seeing other examples of that all across the province. We put forward a modernized mining act um, that indeed uh, uh, continued to, to provide the clarity that industry was looking for, but also updated so it was very much reflective of 21st century values. So that's why we have uh, included in that uh, considerable uh, changes in how we con consult with our Aboriginal communities and our Aboriginal leadership. So I'm a little startled by the uh, question. I suspect that in the supplementary I may get some more details or more specifics, but indeed uh, um, we're, we're seeing 23 new mines opening up in the last uh, uh, 10 years and we're going to continue to see positive opportunities in the mining sector here in the province of Ontario. Yes, I, uh, I incorrectly identified the member from Halton on an issue, and I apologize. Carry on. Supplement. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker. Again to the minister. I can say with confidence that challenges to northern development are happening all across the north, and that communities and businesses agree that the framework and the government guidance are just not there. This is precisely why the NDP has been calling on the government to take a leadership role in creating a real plan and engaging in real consultation that will benefit job creation in this province. When will this government stop avoiding challenges and get to work creating a real plan for job creation in the mining sector? Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I mean, we, um, we brought a 100-year-old piece of legislation uh, into the 21st century by introducing <laughs> rules and structure that will improve and that have improved how exploration activities are carried out in the province of Ontario. We are, we are in the process of an of a, of a, of a extraordinary consultation with uh, Matawa First Nations uh, and, and the province uh, with, in negotiating um, the, the, the moving forward on the Ring of Fire development, which again is unprecedented. It's historic, which began with a meeting that the Premier Premier, myself, and the Aboriginal Affairs Minister had. The fact is that we're working very, very closely with the mining sector, looking forward to uh, seeing them all joining us here next week. So I certainly would uh, invite my colleague uh, uh, to have some discussions with us about this. We are going to continue to move forward. We've got great positive developments in the mining sector. Yes, we're going to continue to see it, creating more jobs, more opportunity for everybody in the province of Ontario. Thank you. Question the member from Ottawa, Louise. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Research and Innovation. The Ottawa area is home to many innovative companies. These companies have been creating innovative products that help people across the province, including Emma Rose Gibson from the Ottawa area. Emma, a legally blind fourth grade student, is one of the first users of the eSight eyewear, a pair of computerized glasses developed by the Ottawa based eSight Corporation. Since May, Emma has been wearing the glasses. Not only do they grant her a greater degree of mobility, we are also helping her participate in a new way in her classroom. Recently, Emma said, I went from just seeing nothing to seeing everything in my classroom. The development of these eSight computerized glasses is made possible through financial support from our government. I'm happy to see that our investments are helping people, helping children in a very positive way. Despite the investment in several research and development initiatives, many entrepreneurs Question. across Ontario have a hard time turning their innovative ideas into innovative products. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Research and Innovation, what is our government doing to help entrepreneurs take their innovative ideas and products? Thank you. Minister of Research and Innovation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Ottawa Orleans for that question. Mr. Speaker, our government recognizes the importance of providing support to innovative companies to thrive and compete in the global market. Our investment accelerated fund, for example, Mr. Speaker, assists innovative and emerging companies uh, to date, the Investment Accelerated Fund program has made investments in 68 promising Ontario companies, which created 1,100 jobs. Our Ontario Demonstration Funds, Mr. Speaker, funds companies looking to commercialize new technologies uh, that have both commercial and environmental impacts. To date, the Innovation Demonstration Fund program has committed to 41 projects and expected to create over 4,100 jobs. Mr. Speaker, I am proud to say that our investments help many young and innovative yes, companies of not only to compete in Ontario, but around the world. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I'm glad that our government has invested in the initiatives needed to help companies move their ideas to the expensive commercialization process. Emma Rose Gibson's story illustrates how important it is to continue supporting innovative companies 
develop their ideas into new products and services so that we can improve the quality of life for all Ontarians. As the minister knows, our government has consistently supported Ontario's strong health care system through strategic investments to ensure that the needs of the residents are effectively looked after. One of the ways this can be accomplished is through research and innovation in life sciences and technology. We need to create the right conditions to allow our health and technology sectors to make breakthroughs and advances that will increase the standard of care in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, through you, the Minister of Research and Innovation, what other initiatives is the government undertaking to foster innovation in the Ontario health care system? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, I want to thank the member from Ottawa, Orlean, for that very important question. Mr. Speaker, our government recognizes that innovation will help our province to stay at the forefront of health research in the world. We have invested, for example, Mr. Speaker, $100 million in Ontario Brain Institute to support research in the field of brain diseases. We have also invested $357 million in the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research, which is one of the leading institutions in the world. And we have committed, Mr. Speaker, $1.3 billion to support research in various fields in Ontario research institutions through the Ontario Research Fund. Answer. Mr. Speaker, I am proud to say that our investments in health research has provided a better health care to Ontarians across the province. Thank, Thank you. you. New question. <laughs> Member from Simcoe North. To, uh, speaker, my, my question is to the Minister of Training, College and Universities. Uh, and as you know, as we mentioned the other day, it's uh, Small Business Week here in Ontario. And to help celebrate uh, Small Business Week, I introduced the No New Tax for Business Act oh, that will great. protect small business from being punished by your new trades tax, courtesy of the Ontario College of Trades. And Mr. Speaker, uh, the bill removes Section 7 out of the College of Trades Act so that business, businesses can't, uh, can't be taxed. So, Minister, will you support my bill to protect small businesses from the newest Liberal tax that will kill jobs and hurt small businesses here in our province? Minister of Training Colleges and Universities. I don't think I could have been more clear when I answered this very same question earlier in the week. Uh, we did not proclaim that section. We have no intentions of proclaiming that section. So let's be very, very clear here, because I think the members trying to ensure that are trying to, to allow businesses to think something other than what's going on here. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, businesses do not have to pay uh, to uh, to be involved with the College of Trades. We would encourage them to do so. I'm a little concerned as I look at the member's, member's bill. He supports what we're doing on one part of the bill, but is the member suggesting that businesses should not be involved in the skilled trades? Is he suggesting that the businesses should not get involved with the College of Trades? I think that's a, I think that's a pretty dangerous thing to want to suggest. Businesses should that's be involved. They're an important part of the industry. It's everybody working together that's going to help us build a strong economy. Why would you want to Thank divide you. them all up? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, I want the businesses involved. I don't want them taxed. That's right. That's what I don't want them taxed. That's what your bill does. I can, I can tell you firsthand that small businesses value certainty and transparency. And you're talking about transparency all week. I'm, I, if you, if you never intend to proclaim Section 7, then why do you have it? Let's remove it. That's what I'm, that's what I'm asking you today. Unless you plan to use the small businesses to pay for your $1 billion gas plant scandal or other runaway spending and all the messes you've made over there, you should do the right thing. Section 7 is a huge tax hike looming over the small businesses here in our provinces. But can you do something, Minister? Pass my bill and show small businesses that they never will have to pay the College of Trades business tax. Will you stand with small businesses and support the, the new Tax for Business Act, Bill 118, my new private member's bill? Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Minister? On this week, Mr. Speaker, we did not proclaim Section 7. We, don't have any, we do not have any intentions of proclaiming Section 7. We will not be looking to businesses to pay fees unless they choose to do so. And Mr. Speaker, if the member really cared about small business, he would have, uh, he would have supported our employer health tax exemption, which is providing benefit to 60,000 small businesses across this province. If you really cared about small businesses, you would have supported that. You didn't. So, Mr. Speaker, I think what we're seeing here is a bunch of propaganda, a bunch of rhetoric. At the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, we got to get every sector in this province working together to create jobs and build a small economy. We want businesses to work with the College of Trades, be involved with the College of 
Stop the clock, please. When I say thank you, that's it. And when I stand, you sit. New question, please. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, this government ruined a lot of Thanksgiving dinners in Niagara when it held a Friday before the long weekend press conference to cut the Fort Erie racetrack out from the province's horse racing plans. While the Premier took political cover behind one of her many advisory panels, families were suddenly faced with agonizing choices. Keep feeding horses that may never race again at Fort Erie Racetrack, or try to sell the horses, try to sell the farm, and leave their homes and livelihoods behind. After gutting the local economy, the Premier promised a different kind of future for Fort Erie. Can she kindly tell the people who actually live there what she has in mind? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, what I have said repeatedly is that uh, Fort Erie can work with the Ontario Racing Commission and with the OLG, Mr. Speaker, to determine what that future would look like. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, I hope that happens. I hope that there can be uh, there can be a, an arrangement that is put in place so that Fort Erie can continue to race as as there was a season this year, Mr. Speaker. So my hope is that they will uh, they will do that. You know what our horse racing transition panel has done, Mr. Speaker, is it's put in place a plan that we are implementing that will put $400 million over five years to put in place a sustainable horse racing industry in the province. That did not exist, Mr. Speaker. We did not have a sustainable plan. The SARP plan was not sustainable over the long term, Mr. Speaker. It wasn't transparent. It wasn't open. And Elmer Buchanan Answer. and John Snowblin and John Wilkinson did us a huge service by putting in place a plan that we can now invest in over the next five years. Speaker, nobody in Fort Erie has any idea what festival racing even means, and frankly, Speaker, neither does the government. This week, in question period, the Premier washed her hands of the people who make a living from horse racing at the Fort Erie track. She told them to sort out their consolation prize with the OLG. But the OLG isn't talking to them either, Speaker. Time is running out, and livelihoods are ha hanging in the balance. Why is this government so determined to make sure that there is no 117th racing season at Fort Erie Racetrack? Minister of Rural Affairs. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And we do, we do have a good plan in place, a plan that's been developed by John Snowbullen, Albert Buchanan, and John Wilkinson. And let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, our plan is galloping forward. The NDP plan is still at the starting gate. Thank you. New question, the member from Scarborough Rouge River. My question is to the Minister of Consumer Services. Minister, in my community of Scarborough Rouge River, I've always heard cases of constituents being scammed when buying cards from private sellers. With a large population of new Canadians in the riding and the dependency on cars to get around, I've been attempting to inform my constituents on what to be aware of when buying cars from private sellers. I have informed my constituents to be aware of unlicensed dealers who pose as private sellers. In the past, they have usually targeted buyers of inexpensive, reliable, and economic vehicles. However, I'm now aware of cases where these private Excuse sellers are dealing in newer and luxury models. They are also now more and more moving to online methods of selling high-end cars and pickup trucks. Thank you. Speaker, is the minister aware of the Thank you. Minister of Consumer Services. Thank you, Speaker. And I'd like to thank the member very much, the member from Scarborough Rouge River, for raising this very important question. He's absolutely right. There's a new and growing trend of online targeting of luxury brand cars by private sellers. The Ontario Motor Vehicle Industry Council, also known as OMVUC, which falls under the auspices of my ministry, is uh, regulating vehicle sales, and they have found in a recent investigation this trend that uh, the member speaks of. And many of these private sellers may try to represent themselves as legitimate dealers when, in fact, they're not. And they also misrepresent the vehicles they're actually selling. 
These vehicles are often insurance write-offs, accident damage vehicles, or they have the odometers tampered with, Mr. Speaker. Answer. Similar to most things, consumers are looking online for vehicle sales, and research by the Used Car Dealer Association found that one-third of vehicles for sales online were Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, that is a higher number of online ads by these private sellers than I would have thought. Mr. Speaker, I consider myself a smart consumer, but even I was surprised by the details of some of the ads found online on the internet. It was, very, it was easy to see how a strongly motivated buyer can drop their guard and go after the car or truck that they've always wanted to own. Mr. Speaker, some buyers are even putting down payments without physically having seen the vehicle to ensure that they would get the vehicle at the discounted price. However, Mr. Speaker, my concern, especially with online ads, is that if the consumer was scammed, it is difficult to verify and catch the people behind them as these crimes are becoming borderless and faceless. Minister, how can I help ensure my constituents are not being taken for a ride? Thank you. Minister. Thank you. Well, of course, I think the member from Scarborough Rouge River is a very informed constituent as well. Um, but I, and I appreciate him bringing this, this forward. The Motor Vehicle Dealers Act does maintain a fair and transparent marketplace by requiring dealers that they provide all in price advertising, mandatory full disclosure vehicle history, and cancellation rights. This act, administered by OMVIC, along with the compensation fund to support consumers in certain situations, is in place, Speaker. However, it's very important that consumers do understand that they are only protected by Ontario's consumer protection laws when they buy from an OMVIC registered dealer. Yes, if they buy privately, Speaker, and something happens, OMVIC is unable to intervene. I encourage all consumers to be careful when making a vehicle purchase decision and buy from a registered Deal. Thank you. Thank New you. question, the member for Yes, uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of the Environment. Minister, last month we called on your government to produce a real plan for jobs in the economy. But what did we get? Nothing. A reckless proposal job to killer. take half Nothing. a billion dollars out of Ontario's manufacturing sector. This killer. isn't a credible jobs plan. This is the same risky economic theory you used for the Green Energy Act. And look what happened. The yeah. Liberal government killed thousands of manufacturing jobs just to subsidize a few green jobs. Minister, how can Ontarians take you seriously when your government's only job plan is to saddle the manufacturing sector with a half a billion dollars in new costs? That's a good question. Good question. Good question. Minister? Well, once again, Mr. Speaker, I want to express sympathy with the member because when his leader had the shuffle and was moving people around, front seats, back seats, and, and, uh, and to new portfolios, uh, I thought that he would request not to be the uh, critic for environment because all the questions you ask are anti-environment. I, I really am sympathetic because I think in his heart of hearts, the member probably is an environmentalist. Yes. But he's, yes. Com yeah. but he's compelled. He's compelled to ask anti-environment questions. He obviously doesn't want the producers of these materials to pay the cost. He wants the taxpayers of this province to pay the cost. And I think it is up to those who produce the waste in the first place to assume the cost and not the taxpayers of this province, Answer. who I will stand up for. Government House Leader on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wish to correct my record. During question period, I indicated that the government had, in fact, introduced lobbyist legislation. The fact is that we stated our intention publicly to introduce that legislation. It was not introduced. Thank you. The Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I would like to correct the record as well in my response to the member for Algoma Manitoulin. I indicated that. Ontario has opened up uh, 23 new mines in the last 10 years. Uh, the fact is, Mr. Speaker, we've opened up 24 oh. new mines in the last 10 years. Minister of Energy and Point of Order. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to correct the record. Uh, when I spoke of $15 billion cost, I was referring to the cost of new nuclear, not refurbishment. Ah. 
Pursuant to standing order 38A, the member from Simcoe North has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities concerning the College of Trades Amendment Act. This matter will be debated next Tuesday at 6 p.m. There are no deferred votes. This House stands adjourned until recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.